Awesome. It looks like almost everybody's joining in. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hope that my video is crystal clear. I just got a haircut and I know you all really just come here to see me. So hope that's crystal clear for you guys today. We're going to be talking about charge, discharge, and understanding state of charge with our lithium iron phosphate batteries today. And I want to start off with just a little bit of housekeeping. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the question and answer bar. That's going to be probably at the bottom of your screen, but it could be at the top, depending on your screen layout. Don't bother raising your hand. Um, I won't be able to unmute you, unfortunately, until the very end when we can discuss all the questions. So um, I see a couple raised hands. So just type your question in the Q&A section and I'll try to get to it as soon as I can. But if, if I can't get to it right away, we'll discuss all the questions at the end. If you do need NAPSEP credits, I will be giving those out. So wait till the end of the presentation. I'll show you my email and you can just request your NAPSEP certificates there. Awesome. So now that we're through all the boring stuff, let's go ahead and get, get started with charge, discharge, and state of charge today. I'm gonna begin with a brief overview of our company, where we've been, what our history looks like and where we're going in the future. So we were actually founded, not as Simplify, but we were founded as OES Energy in 2010. And we were founded to solve a problem. Now that problem was unsafe lithium chemistries causing hazards on the market. In addition, there were many drawbacks and limitations to lead acid batteries that were just failing in the field, often due to improper maintenance, but ultimately just a major issue that we were born to solve. Now, we were born into the mobile industry, really making Hollywood, uh, we were making power packs for Hollywood filmmakers. So they were using them in their camera equipment, something that had to be robust and had to be able to handle you know, a lot of vibration. So we understand the mobile industry. And then in 2011, we were actually able to prove how safe lithium iron phosphate batteries were. The military did not want to use lithium batteries in an application, a project that they were working on. However, we were able to convince them to just go ahead and test the batteries and to see if they're up to your standards. And sure enough, we were able to prove that the lithium iron phosphate chemistry met and exceeded all of their safety standards because they tested our batteries and were very impressed. So in 2013 and 14, we continued to expand our product line, focusing on consumer friendly products and installer friendly products. Now, 2015 to 16, we actually relaunched and that's when we became Simplify Power. And as of now, we are ramping up our manufacturing capacity at our facility in Ventura County, California. So as most of you already know, I'm gonna assume you've seen the battery 101 and you understand that we only use lithium iron phosphate chemistry. We do not use any chemistries that contain cobalt because cobalt can result in the battery being a lot less thermally stable. We also have chosen cylindrical form factor. So cylindrical form factor is kind of like a double A battery. A pouch cell is awesome for smaller applications. You'll often find them in laptops, but it's a little bit more prone to swelling and even puncture. Um, Prismatic cells are awesome, but they're a bit bulkier. So cylindric cells, excuse me, cylindrical cells actually allow us to fit the most amount of energy storage into the smallest and most durable package. We've also found them to just provide the best lifespan and performance. So as I explained, we were founded to solve a problem of unsafe lithium chemistries and the drawbacks of lead acid batteries. But now that problem has really evolved. 
there are escalating energy costs here in the US. I know I've seen my rate rise ever since I became a renter. And now as a homeowner, my rates are still rising every year. The infrastructure that we know as the grid is continuing to fail. You know, the transmission lines and transformers are getting older and older and really not being replaced until they break. So failures are continuing to happen. Additionally, there is a growing need for decarbonization. Now, many cities and utilities are demanding that they want all the energy provided to them to be 100% carbon free, calling it net zero carbon in a lot of cases, but they don't have a clear path to meet those goals. So that's where we come in with distributed assets. Now distributed assets are essentially energy storage distributed all around at different homes and places. That's going to allow you to not only combat these issues, but actually also even assist the grid in preventing failures. Our batteries are used in a variety of applications, including peak shaming, shaving, no shaming around here, just peak shaving, time of use rates, and integrated solar and storage. So peak shaving is essentially, um, you can actually get charged a peak demand charge if let's say you run your washer dryer and your electric stove at the same time, you might draw enough power to where the utility company says, okay, you've exceeded the amount of power that we want to provide you at your base rate, we're now going to charge you an extra demand charge. Time of use is when you get charged a higher rate in the evening often than during the day because there's a higher demand on the grid during the evening. So in order to combat that, you can use batteries to buy power during the cheapest hours and then use it whenever you want. And of course, integrated solar plus storage, as you all know, you know, solar energy is provided during the day. And most of us are going to use it only in the mornings and at night when we're actually home because we're often working during the day. Cool. So we're going to do a quick overview of our products and then we'll talk about how to understand charging, discharging and state of charge as it relates to these products. Our bread and butter right here, this is our 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. It comes in 24 and 48 volt options. At 24 volts, it's about 150 amp hours and at 48 volts, 75 amp hours. Now, you cannot stack these in series. So you cannot make 48 volts out of a 24 volt battery. You only wanna wire these in parallel. It's a simple parallel connection to a common bus point such as a bus bar or combiner box. A couple other wiring methods um, that you can see in our Battery 101 um, presentation. This is a really modular and infinitely scalable solution, right? So you can stack as many of these batteries in parallel as you want. There's really no limit. So they're 86 pounds and as many as one person wants to carry in and out of a job site, they can stack in parallel. I've seen over 80 batteries put into one system. And I'm sure that there's been bigger ones that I just haven't caught wind of. The battery was actually created as a drop in lead acid replacement, but now it's being used for all sorts of different things. It's got an integrated battery management system, AKA BMS to keep the cells balanced and provide additional protection. It's also got a circuit breaker integrated on the top of the battery. That's gonna make installs a lot easier. You can essentially make the battery not live. So there's no output at the terminals during you know, your install until you switch it on when you have everything wired and ready to go. And we also have a 1.4 kilowatt hour battery, comes in 12 volt and 24 volt options. Again, this is scalable. You can add as many as you want in parallel and it only weighs 33 pounds. Now this is great for mobile applications, not only because of the size, but also because it comes with the Anderson cable. 
a lot of times you do not want, you know, big beefy terminals poking up in inside of a vehicle. This is also, as with all of our products, compatible with a big range of charge controllers and inverters. You know, most of the big name brands are able to be used with our batteries. We're not super specific here uh, as far as which brand you use. We'll get into that a bit more later. This battery also has an integrated BMS. No breaker on this battery, as often you're going to have an uh, easier time finding a DC disconnect for a smaller system like this. Now our access unit, this is becoming really popular, I think for both new and also existing PV systems because it is outdoor rated. So for example, if you've got an AC coupled solar system, all that equipment's already outside and you wanna throw this unit in outside as well, it makes the wiring a bit easier for the installer. There's a lot of options here. Um, again, our battery 101 is gonna have more details on those specific options, but there's options for Schneider inverters or Solark inverter. And both those units can work with AC or DC coupled systems, new or existing PV. The Solark has MPPTs built in, for example, um, or can be used AC coupled. And then the Schneider unit with the 6848 inverter that's going to be AC coupled standard and then DC coupled, you can add the charge controller if you want. Also, monitoring is going to be a big um, selling factor on these if you're an installer, you know, showing that option of monitoring to your customer. Our newest product is the Amplify battery. This battery is essentially the same inner workings of the Phi 3.8. It's got, you know, the 3.8 kilowatt hours, 75 amp hours, same nominal voltage. However, you're now able to access a higher max discharge rating with a 100 amp breaker. It's got the same dimensions and weight, so it's going to fit into any existing wall brackets, access units, or boss cabinets that you already have. And in addition, now it's able to provide closed loop communications with the inverter. This is only gonna work with communicating inverters. Right now, the communicating inverter is the sole arc, and that is all. We are working on expanding that list though, but the closed loop communications is gonna have several benefits here. So it's going to auto-populate some of the most important set points. So such as you know the charge voltage and the low battery cutout. It's also gonna provide a higher level of protection. So it's going to basically communicate to that inverter how, how many batteries are in the system and what their total charge and discharge rating is. And the inverter is gonna read that and respect it. So it also provides feedback instantaneously as far as state of charge, voltage, and charge and discharge rate. This is going to be really useful for those customers who really want an accurate and reliable way to read state of charge. Additionally, by communicating these set points such as charge and discharge, amperage and voltage to the inverter, we can actually approve a uh, flexible sizing. So if you want to put one Amplify battery on a Solark 8K inverter or 12K inverter, you can do that. Now the inverters charging and discharging uh, capabilities are going to be limited, of course. And one of my friends compared this to buying a sports car and setting the, you know, speed limit on the car to 50 miles an hour, but it can be done. And especially it's useful for those customers who need to start on a small budget and want to work up from there and add batteries as they go. Now, you cannot pair one Phi battery with the solar converter, you'd need to size properly, but you can pair one Amplify battery with a solar converter if you have communications enabled. Hope that makes sense. Um, let me know if there are any questions on that. Now we're gonna jump into charging characteristics of Phi batteries. So Phi batteries are rated at C over two. So what this means is you can charge them at 
in as little as two hours. Ultimately, for a 3.8 kilowatt hour battery, this means you can charge it half that. This is 1.9 kilowatts. So another way to look at it, it's a 75 amp hour battery. Cut that in half, you've got 37 and a half amps DC. For the 24 volt battery, it's 75 amps DC because the battery is 150 amp hours. So you're still charging at a higher rate of current, but a lower voltage. With our 12 volt battery, I believe it is a bit lower than C over two actually. 40 amps DC, I believe it's a 112 amp hour battery or so. So it's, it's more like C over three. With the Amplify, it is the same charge and discharge rate. Again, we're looking at C over two. However, it can communicate this to the inverter instead of you having to size the system correctly. Now, one thing I want to point out here is if you're using a system with multiple charge sources, such as an inverter charger and a charge controller, make sure that you limit them accordingly. So either you want to make sure that they don't come on at the same time, or that if they do come on at the same time, that the charge current of both of those added together is still under that 37 and a half amp per battery limit. Now this limit does scale up. So as you add, let's say if you have two batteries on a system, that limit goes from 37 and a half to 75 amps is your new charging limit. If you've got four batteries, it's 150 amps. I'm gonna be referring to a lot of the specs in, in terms of the 48 volt battery today. Um, so hopefully you can just work with me on that. As far as limiting the charge current, which I talked about, you know, multiple charge sources, make sure you limit the current. The way you actually do that is you go into the charge controller, either using the remote that communicates with it or on the charge controller screen itself. For example, if you have a Midnight Classic 150, you can go right on the screen there and just program in the max charge current limit. Same with an inverter charger, you, you're easily able to you know, program in the max charging limit. The difference though, is with a charge controller, if you have an oversized PV array and a small battery bank, and you're not following the C over two limit, it's okay because the battery, the charge controller is able to reliably limit that current to the number that you set in the controller. So as long as you program the system correctly, you will be okay. With an inverter charger, if that's oversized, often you're not able to effectively limit the charge current and you're really rarely often to you're rarely able to you know limit the discharge current we'll talk about that later but you want to make sure you follow the c over two sizing rule with the inverter charger what that means is basically if you've gotten eight kilowatt inverter got to double that kilowatt value that means on an eight kilowatt inverter you need 16 kilowatt hours of storage to you know, eliminate the risk of over discharge current. Unless you have an Amplify battery, again, with closed loop communications like the Amplify Solar Combo, then you can kind of disregard this sizing rule as the Amplify will limit its own discharging when communicating. So now we don't want to ignore the C over two rule if we're AC coupling either. AC coupling is a bit different of an animal, right? So you've got this array. Let's say you've got a large array that's selling to the grid. And then all of a sudden the grid shuts off and all that excess power while the array is shutting down is actually funneled to the battery bank since the grid is now disconnected. If the batteries are already full and they're charging at a really fast rate from that array, it could damage them pretty quickly, right? It could cause a high voltage event. So we wanna avoid that and just make sure your system is sized according to the C over two rule for AC coupled PV. So if you've got, again, eight kilowatts of AC coupled PV, you're gonna need 16 kilowatt hours of battery storage. 
You're also going to want to consider the amount of AC coupled PV you have um, connected to your inverter in general. All of them have, you know, their own limits there. So you want to make sure you follow that first and foremost as well. On your charge controller, we're often going to be using um, two stage charging. So bulk and then absorb. And actually, I'll take that back. We're most often going to be using three stage charging on a charge controller, bulk, absorb, and then float. So bulk is going to provide constant current, as much current as it can provide until that voltage is reached, that bulk, bulk and absorb voltage of 56 volts DC. So again, I'm referring to the 48 volt version, charges at 56 volts for absorb. For the 24 volt version, you're just going to cut that voltage in half. Now we want to set a six minute timer for that absorb voltage. So that's the constant voltage stage. So basically the current is going to taper off. The charge controller is going to provide less and less power while the battery kind of fills up very slowly at the end of that absorb stage. And then after six minutes, it's going to stop and switch to the float stage. Now, you do not need to float your lithium iron phosphate batteries. It's, it's not like lead acid where they're going to quickly self-discharge or really need to have a float charge to get full. You're welcome to use float because it's going to help your batteries and charge controller power loads during the day, but also can continue keeping the battery full while PV is available. Instead of charging full, and then discharging the batteries to power the loads, but then going to bed and realizing, oh shoot, my bank is only at 60%. That's why I like to use float with uh, renewable sources like charge controllers. You can also utilize the rebulk voltage. You can raise that to whatever you feel comfortable with. I'd say don't go above 52, uh, unless you talk to us about that and, and I would just suggest 52 is probably the highest I would go on rebulk, but that's going to trigger a new charge when your batteries drop below 52 volts. So inverters are a bit different. You want to do two stage charging on inverters, meaning just bulk and then absorb. You don't want to use float on an AC source. For example, if you left your generator running just to float the battery bank, and provide very minimal current, it's a, it's a waste of fuel. So we don't wanna be bothering with that. However, the uh, bulk and absorb voltage is still gonna be 56 volts, no matter whether you're charging from the inverter, the grid, the uh, generator, or a PV, like I said before. <clears throat> this may vary a bit though, based on the inverter brand. We do have all of our guides on our website. If you can't find them, just email me or email our tech support department and we will route you to the guides for your equipment. So with, a, with an AC coupled PV array, it's really important to be using this 56 volt absorb voltage because it's gonna help with frequency shifting. For whatever reason, frequency shifting does not work too well when you're using a lower charging voltage. With older models, you may not even have frequency shifting capabilities on your inverter, so this may not even come into play for you. If you're wondering if your inverter is compatible with our batteries, first ask yourself, does it hit those charging set points, you know, 56 volts, and does it have some sort of a timer or end amp current limit? Additionally, does your manufacturer warranty for lithium ion batteries? If they don't manufacture for lithium batteries, it's probably a sign that the inverter is not made for them. And last but not least, probably the most important thing to check when you're wondering if your inverter is capable with our batteries is the low battery cutout. We really don't wanna see it ever, ever discharged below 48 volts. That's the absolute minimum. And then cut that in half for 24 volt batteries. 24 volts is the absolute minimum voltage. 
A little bit unrelated here, but if you're using an external charger, so, you know, maybe you've hit low battery cutout internally and you need to bring the battery back up in voltage, uh, make sure that's been approved by us. We do have a list of approved external chargers. This is kind of something you would just plug into a wall similar to an e-bike charger, um, but don't just use any charger out there. Make sure we take a look at it first because some of those have some pretty damaging features. Now the BMS does have um, some shutdown capabilities. If you were to go below that 48 volts, it does protect itself, but this is not to be relied upon repeatedly for protection. Same with the high voltage. Again, really important to be programming correctly. Although the BMS will protect itself, this is not what you wanna rely upon and after repeated, repeated abuse of the battery, it's definitely going to you know, cause damage. Awesome. So any questions about charging, throw this in the q and A. I'm going to give you guys a second here before I start the discharge section. Again, just throw your questions into the Q&A. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't uh, respond to a raised hand, really. I can't unmute you, but I'm happy to answer your questions in the Q&A at the end. All right, so on to discharging. Some key things to understand about discharging a Phi battery is the the curve and what the curve actually looks like. So as you can see, you know, this can be a bit confusing during the, you know, charging your battery is going to charge fully up to 56. But as soon as you pull that charger off the battery, as soon as you put a minimal load on there, it's going to drop down to about 53 volts when it's full. Then from it's going to quickly drop, you know, at around 80 to 90 percent state of charge. It's going to be approximately 52 volts when you're running a load. Then let's say you just keep continuing that load. You're running it steadily. The battery is going to re remain between 52 and 50 volts between almost the entire discharge. So between 90 and 20 percent SOC, it's going to be between 52 and 50 volts approximately definitely varies with the size of your load, but it's just a general rule of thumb. So it's super flat, very a very thin uh, voltage curve. And then as you get down to 10% SOC and below, you begin to drop off very quickly in voltage. So notice what we call the knee. So after hitting 10% SOC, the Voltage is going to drop off this at, at 48 volts, you're at absolute zero, and then it's just going to plummet from there really quickly. This is why it's so important to have a 48 volt low battery cutout minimum. So if you have a really heavy load on your battery, for example, and your 48 volt low battery cutout has a significant delay from the inverter, you might actually not the inverter might not catch it in time. It might not disconnect in time before you hit that knee and you just drop off the cliff on voltage. So one way to avoid that is to set your low battery cutout a bit higher at 50.2 volts. If you don't have that option, you can set your generator to just start up at 50.2 volts or 50.4 or 50.6, whatever you prefer and whatever you find works the best with your system. Definitely, you want to try to catch that before it drops off the knee. You can also kind of set up the grid to recharge your batteries, um, depending on your inverter charger at a certain voltage. You want to set the rebulk above that voltage. So obviously, if your low battery cutout is set at 50.2, you want to initiate the charge uh, before 50.2, so maybe 50.6 or 50.4 at a minimum, I'd say, on your inverter charger. And again, you probably want that rebulk even higher on your PV system. Like I said, maybe as high as 52.
So some more discharging characteristics. Again, our batteries are gonna not only charge at C over two, but they're also gonna discharge at a max of C over two. They do have a surge, which we'll talk about later, but for the continuous discharge, it's the same rating as the charge rating. 37 and a half amps DC for the 75 amp hour 48 volt battery. It's the same rating for the Amplify battery, except again, you have that additional uh, discharge current. So we'll talk about that later, but same discharge rating for the Amplify battery. However, it's going to, of course, communicate those set points to the inverter and protect itself. Whereas the Phi definitely need to be sized correctly on the Phi. So as far as the surge ratings, you can go to 80 amps DC for 10 minutes on the 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. Now, unfortunately, this is the same for both the 48 and the 24 volt battery. So you're gonna have a slightly higher surge for the 48 volt as opposed to 24 in terms of power rating. Since it's the same amperage at a lower voltage for the 24 volt, it's gonna be a little bit lower power rating for your surge. For the 1.4 kilowatt hour battery, you're looking at 60 amps DC for 10 minutes. Again, same surge current for the 12 and 24 volt versions. So if you're looking to start a well pump or maybe a large compressor or something like that, you're gonna want to utilize the surge of those 48 volt batteries, especially if you have like central air conditioning and you need a large startup current you're gonna to want to have the 48 volt system because you can utilize that surge. For residential use, you really never are gonna see C over two discharging needed. At least if you do, it's gonna be very rare. Um, often the C over two charging is much more important, right? So if you've, if you've got a shady, area that you're charging from, your PV array is shaded during the morning and evening hours, you really wanna use that C over two charging to have as large of a PV array as you can. That's where it really comes into handy. Um, but as far as discharging goes, you really are not gonna often see C over two discharging, neither grid tied or uh, off grid. But another advantage of C over two charging is if you're grid tied, you can maximize the size of your PV array to be C over two. It's gonna let you sell the most power you can to the grid and get a better return on investment of your uh, solar and storage system in general. Now, I often see people wanting to use undersized systems like two batteries on a five kilowatt inverter, for example. Not a great idea with Phi. With you know, if you're gonna do it, you can try to use inline breakers for overcurrent protection. It's not 100% effective. There's some things you have to consider as far as where you're placing the breaker. Definitely wants to be in line with the battery bank. I like to put mine between the main DC bus and the, you know, all charging and discharging loads going out and in or out of that DC bus. That's where I like to break the circuit with a breaker there. There is not really an effective way to limit the AC output of the inverter as far as programming in most cases. Some inverters do have this, but most don't. Therefore, it is important to you know, have the AC output in the inverter limited if your battery bank is undersized. So you can limit that with an, a breaker on the AC output of the inverter. Again, not 100% effective, and we definitely just recommend sizing correctly from the start. So we're gonna do an example here as far as breaker sizing. Let's say you have two batteries and you wanna put a breaker on the DC side of the system instead of the AC. Two batteries is a 35 amps each times two 75 amp continuous max discharge. So in that case, you're probably gonna be looking for a 60 amp breaker. You can also Try to get the generator or the grid to help with load support features. 
Often I find that the generator takes a few seconds to start up and, and get running. And it's just often not the best fit for an undersized system. You really just want to size correctly. But in reality, overcurrent protection is it's really useful for any circuit in general, whether it's sized correctly or not. Uh, it's always a good thing to have an added disconnect and an added uh, form of protection on your wiring. It's really just a good rule of thumb in general. Here's why it's so difficult to size overcurrent protection and why it's not 100% reliable. At least part of the reason is because of this trip curve. So we see that the this uh, Blue C Systems 187 circuit breaker designed for DC circuits, it's not going to trip until you've reached about 125% of its current rating. Now, 125% of 60 amps is 75 amps. So in our last example, that's actually perfect. It's going to allow you to use a 75 amps for several seconds. So it looks like about three minutes before it's going to trip which is honestly perfect. However, then we look at this battery. This 60 amp breaker would pop immediately after about five seconds at 60 amps. So that's not really gonna work too well for this circuit. Again, this is another breaker provided by Blue Sea. They have a lot of data available. So it was awesome uh, being able to use their data here. Another example of overcurrent protection, these are really popular in my world of off-grid, you know, camper vans, A and L fuses. Now these don't pop until you reach almost 150% of the rated current value. So a 60 amp fuse wouldn't even pop until about 90 amps. So that wouldn't work either in this case. Now, lastly, we're gonna talk about state of charge. State of charge is one of the most um, frequently asked questions that we get, especially from homeowners who are just not understanding their system. And they're wondering, you know, all these questions about why my batteries are charging when the meter says they're at 100%. And often these meters just aren't 100% reliable. So it's really important to understand state of charge as it relates to voltage as well especially if you're an installer, you know, being able to go on site and, and really optimize the homeowner's set points to what they want to do. Uh, it's really important to understand state of charge of lithium batteries. What we really want to be talking about is resting state of charge. So a lot of people think that when they charge that battery up during absorb to 56, it should just stay there at, when it's at 100% state of charge, but that's not the case. What happens is as soon as you remove that charger and put a small load on the battery, the voltage is gonna drop to about 53.3 or so when it's completely full and you have a very small load on there. Anything above 52.5, you know, if you have a large load on there, it might drop to 52.5 even when it's completely full. So when you're no longer charging, that's when you can you know, talk about resting state of charge. These set points were in a lab. I find that it's slightly higher than these, if anything, um, but they're pretty close to accurate. So, you know, in the real world, things are obviously a little different than what we find in a lab. So there's a lot of battery monitors on the market and I find that most of them just aren't perfect. Um, some of them can be pretty accurate and some of them drift off over time and need calibration. Some are better, not better than others. Um, I really tend to like the Victron BMV 700 or 712. And I find that it gives a really accurate reading of percentage. For the most part, again, it's not perfect, which is why if you wanna use, if your customer wants a high level of accuracy for state of charge readings, best bet is just to use the Amplify battery with a communicating inverter. It's going to read, uh, the Amplify is going to provide the SOC reading directly to the inverter. Additionally, you know, understanding these set points and how state of charge relates to voltage, as an installer, it's going to help you set the correct rebulk or recharge voltage 
based on what the customer wants. Also gonna help you with the cell setting. For example, if you know that your customer's batteries sit at about 53.3 volts when they're completely full, then you probably wanna set the cell voltage about half a volt below that. So maybe 52.8 to make sure that you're selling everything that you can, selling as much power as the system will provide while keeping that battery still pretty full and still around 100% state of charge. Again, it's also gonna help you avoid the knee. So this is when we're talking about the, the voltage drop off near 48 volts. Understanding how voltage and state of charge relate is also helpful with that. And again, these set points that we're talking about, they're going to vary for each inverter or charger or charge controller even. So just check out the guides on our website or email me or our tech support department. Last but not least, before we jump into the Q&A, I do want to talk about our IQ program, our installer qualification program. So if you're already installing our batteries, Here's a great way to get free added exposure through our company. So we can drop a pin for you on this map. There's actually a map of the whole world on here. It's not just North America and South America. You will then be able to be easily found, you know, by customers looking for a battery installer. You're also going to be included in our IQ newsletter. So this gets blasted out monthly and we're happy to you know, include and blast out any awesome videos or photos that you share with us. Ultimately, it's just a great way to get added visibility as an installer looking to you know, secure more installs. If you're a distributor, this is gonna be something you wanna encourage your installers to do. It's just gonna help keep a steady flow of Simplify sales coming back to you. It's also going to show that you know what you're doing and your installers can be relied upon. So if you're already installing our batteries today, again, just contact me or click the link right here and you can go ahead and hop over to our application. It's, it's a really quick application. And if you've already been installing our batteries, it should be a no brainer. Awesome. So last but not least, I wanna thank everybody for joining and then I'm gonna go ahead and hop right into the Q&A and check out some questions that you guys have submitted. Our solar power system is maintaining the bank between 93 and 100% state of charge. How many times per year should the system be cycled? For example, how many times per year should I perform a grid down test? So, Tom, you're gonna to perform a grid down test whenever you want, right? You really don't need to be cycling the batteries to keep them healthy, but it's good practice just to make sure everything's working. I would, I would personally do it about twice a year. But if you're using that for backup purely and it's really important, you always have the power there, you don't necessarily need to cycle the system at a, any specific interval. Why not series connections for the 3.8 at 24 volts to 48 volts? Well, first off, it's really just not needed. I mean, we do provide the 48 volt batteries. Batteries, uh, They're readily available. But secondly, that's going to damage your battery bank. Essentially, the BMS is just not designed to handle uh, higher voltage than it's made for. Lithium iron phosphate batteries versus other chemistries. Essentially, lithium iron phosphate batteries are just so much more thermally stable, right? So they're, they're able to reach higher temperature before entering thermal runaway. And then if they did enter thermal runaway, that um, heat is likely to not propagate to other cells because it's such a small amount of energy released due to that lack of cobalt. So really, cobalt-based chemistries um, are much less thermally stable and therefore a little bit less safe. Is the, 10, is the 10,000 cycles at a specific temperature? No, it's not at a specific temperature. However, the operating range of the batteries is between uh, negative four degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. 
but you do not want to charge the batteries below freezing, 32, below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a good question there, charging and discharging temperatures. Do you have the ability to set this up as self-supply? Absolutely. So these batteries can be, you know, self-supply. Uh, they can work on a self-supply system. That's really going to depend on your inverter, though. It's not up to the batteries what they're doing, right? The inverter is going to be telling the system how to operate. Are there big differences in the charge voltage settings for off-grid versus grid backup systems? No, there are not big differences, but I would say the rebulk on an off-grid system probably would be slightly higher than on a grid backup system. On a grid backup system, your batteries probably could use a little extra exercise. So like the gentleman before mentioned, cycling. Um, you may want to set your rebulk a bit lower on a grid tied backup system, but ultimately it's up to your preferences. So no, not a huge difference there. Hey, Native Renewables, great to see you guys on here. Does Do the battery cables need to be the same length from all batteries to the bus bar? Yes. So all the battery cables between the battery terminals and that DC bus bar need to be the same length and same gauge. You can also use a bus bar that goes directly on the battery terminals and then wire that bus bar to the rest of your system if you prefer. There's a few ways to do it that are detailed more in our battery 101 training. But the, the main highlight there is not to daisy chain the batteries when you're wiring. So don't go from positive to positive to positive with wires and then to the DC bus bar. That's gonna create imbalances. You wanna go from each positive directly to the bus bar and then each negative directly to a negative bus bar. What does it look like when the BMS disconnects the battery? Does it physically trip the breaker or just go offline? Great question. The BMS when it disconnects, it does not physically disconnect the breaker. So if the BMS disconnects, it's just going to show a very low output voltage on the battery. Often it's between zero and 20 volts, for example. Why would you use 60 amps DC instead of 75 amps for the 3.8 kilowatt hour phi? I'm not really sure what you're referring to. Um, are you talking about max discharge? Are you talking about an older version of the battery, 24, 48 volts? Just let me know so I can answer your question. As a supplier, will storing the batteries impact their lifetime? No, the, the batteries can be stored really at any um, state of charge. However, I would recommend giving them a charge, definitely if they're stored more than a year, but probably good to check up on them every six months or so. Can you please give price for the battery? Um, for all our batteries, we sell through our distribution network. So I'd, I'm happy to connect you to a distributor. You know, if you if you need pricing, you should contact them and we can find one that has the best pricing for you. That helps us keep pricing low and keep shipping you know, and availability fast. I also want to point out my email training at simplifypower.com. That's the email you should send your request for NAPSEP certificates. So if you need credits, email us with like just say, hi, I need credits and then send me your full name so that I can include it on your certificate. I meant for the 40, okay. So this person was asking about the 60 amp DC breaker instead of a 75 amp DC breaker. So that really goes back to the, um, the breaker trip curve. I'll see if I can go back here.
So again, this breaker trip curve is different than this breaker trip curve, right? With this battery, maybe with this, you know, um, breaker here, maybe a 60 amp breaker would work. But with this breaker, excuse me, with this battery, a 60 amp breaker would open the circuit right at 60 amps, uh, apparently. With this breaker, it would open the circuit at about 125% of its rated current. So 125% of 60 is about 75. That's when we want the circuit to open. So that's why we chose the 60 amp breaker, for example, in this case. But again, you know, that's why overcurrent protection is tricky. All right, everybody, thanks so much for joining in today. Have an awesome rest of your day, and I will see you next time.